Hello everyone. Welcome to the session two of Unit Five, Static Timing Analysis. Uh, in this session, we will uh, talk about the interconnects and delay calculation. Now, uh, the agenda is uh, we'll see what interconnects are, uh, what are the interconnect, various interconnect models. We'll see uh, the wireload models. There is some overlap with what we studied in Unit Three, but uh, there are a couple of uh, more. Uh, we'll go a bit more detail into wireload models. We look at parasitic formats, uh, and then we look at delay calculation. Now, going back to the uh, session one of static timing analysis, we learned that static timing analysis is of two parts. Uh, the first is the delay calculation, and the second is the checking against the constraints. So, uh, it is the first part we will concentrate on the delay calculation part. Now, delay uh, again is comprised of uh, uh, two elements. Uh, so, two elements are responsible for the delay one is the cell, other is the next. The cell delay comes from the library. We all know that. Actually, not the not the uh, in in the NLDM format. Yes, the delay is uh, the delay numbers are represented in uh, lookup tables, and uh, a tool like Prime Time just has to do uh, interpolation based on the uh, transitions, input transitions, and output load. On the other hand, uh, so the the internet delay. Uh, an STA tool does not have the net delay directly. It will always gather the value of resistance and capacitance of the net, and then it has to do the delay calculation itself using some method, some formula. So that is the concept we'll we'll look at in this session. So a net, uh, the properties of net are a net is a wire connecting pins of standard cells and blocks. So any two cells would be connected by an by an interconnect or a net, and a net obviously has only one driver. There are uh, nets that has have multiple drivers, but in that case, consider uh, a net that is being driven by, uh, let's say, uh, two drivers. One of them will be in a tri-state at any given point of time. Uh, so, uh, in effect, effectively, there should be only one driver on a net. Uh, what is a driver? A driver will be a cell. The cell will uh, drive the net value to either zero or one, depending on the logic state. So uh, it is. It has only one driver for any effective calculation. Net can drive a number of fan out cells or blocks. Uh, so you can have uh, so on the on the on one side you have a driver. On other side you have with, uh, the receivers. Now there can be there is always one driver, but the number of receivers can be many. In that case, net will be segmented, obviously. So let's say a, a buffer is driving four other buffers. So there will be there will be one net going from the output of the driver buffer, and then the net will be segmented, uh, and then it will drive the uh, different fanouts. Uh, now this segmentation can happen in number of ways. Physically, I'm talking about physical. Logically, it's only it it will be just one net. There's only one logical net from driver to four fanout uh, uh, receivers. But physically, the segmentation can happen at number of points. It depends on the routing, on the timing constraints, and so on. And then the net can travel on multiple metal layers of the chip. Now, a chip is three-dimensional in nature in the sense that uh, you have a chip is comprised of layers. So uh, at the bottom, you have uh, the diffusion layer, the poly, which which makes up the standard cells. And over and above that, there will be metal layers going throughout the chip that will uh, connect the uh, drivers and receivers. That will connect the standard cells together. Now, these metal layers are numbered like metal one, metal two, metal three, metal four, and so on. So, uh, a typical uh, 65 nanometer process or a 45 nanometer process might have six metal layers or eight metal layers, and so on. Usually, there are about six to eight metal layers in a, in a particular process. So if metal one is horizontal, metal two will be vertical. If metal two, and so on. So uh, two consecutive layers will be vertical and horizontal to reduce uh, signal integrity issues. So uh, a net can travel on multiple metal layers of the chip, and it can be broken up into segments for equivalent electrical representation. We'll see what segments are and how does STA tool uses those segments. This is just to make uh, the clarify the concept of a net. 
Now an interconnect will have three uh, parasitics. Parasitic means unwanted. Uh, parasitic by uh, literally means something which is feeding off some some uh, a parasite is a is something that feeds on a host or it's undesirable, not needed. So the R, L, and C for an interconnect are undesirable. So we would want to use technique to keep the numbers as low as possible, right? Uh, interconnect resistance is between the output pin of a cell and the input pin of the fan out cell. Interconnect capacitance, uh, every node, every input of a cell or every output of a cell or every net itself will have some capacitance with ground and two nets running, uh, uh, two nets will have some capacitance between them, this is called coupling capacitance. There is some interconnect inductance also which arises due to current loops, but uh, it, the value is so low that it can be ignored. So for uh, ASIC design, on-chip interconnects don't show significant inductance. Uh, although on a PCB, since there are long wires running, they show a significant inductance and has to be taken into account for calculation. But when we talk about uh, something that is fabricated on chip, uh, the L value is not of any consideration. So we'll only talk about R and C value. And why they are undesirable? Any resistance will uh, consume power, will make the chip heat up. So obviously our target is to reduce the resistance as to as low as possible. This is why copper interconnect is very, very popular. Again, capacitance, the higher the capacitance, the more time, the more current needed to charge it up to VDD and then to dis discharge it to ground. So the more cell, the more net delay. That's why again, uh, there are techniques to reduce capacitance. Uh, you would probably study in one of the fabrication courses. Uh, uh, there are there are techniques to, so again, I we talked about, uh, there are two types of capacitance. One is with respect to ground, other is with respect to the, between two nets. So uh, since we will, uh, th this is the reason why a metal one, let's say, is horizontal metal two becomes vertical, just to reduce this coupling capacitance. This coupling capacitance causes what is uh, causing an effect with it, which is called noise or glitch. We will see that STA tool also handle, also treat, uh, also uh, sign off your chip for signal integrity issues. We will see what are those, what are those issues and, and how do we check for them. So uh, that's why these R and C values are called parasitic. Now a typical uh, interconnect uh, will have a length L and uh, it will be uh, represented as a, dis as a distributed R RC tree. Uh, what it means is that uh, the trace of length L will be broken down into a number of R values, R and C values. So this is distributed RC tree and now STA tool will employ some techniques to calculate the delay from this node to this node. Let's say this node is driven by a cell, by a buffer and on this node there is a receiving buffer. So what uh, STA tool will do, it will try to, so there will be a waveform here and there will be a waveform here. So what an STA tool will try to do, it will try to calculate delay between these two points, it will use some algorithm and it will try to calculate the delay for this distributed RC tree. In fact, uh, delay calculation for, for nets takes much longer time when compared to delay calculation for cell. The only reason being that the cell delays are represented in a lookup table and the only thing the tool has to do is interpolate. But for in this case, it has to employ some sophisticated numerical analysis technique to calculate it there. Now uh, we'll define few terms here, RT and CT are the total resistance and capacitance of this, this interconnect of length L. Uh, RT is equal to RP into L, CT is equal to CP into L, where the RP and CP are the per unit length values and L is the trace length. Now uh, so there are various models to represent interconnect, some are more accurate, some are less accurate. The less accurate ones, obviously, it will take too less amount of time to uh, to process through because there's less data. The more accurate the model is, the more time it will take the tool to calculate the time uh, to calculate the delay. So one of the models is T model. 
in which total capacitance CT is a uh, model is connected halfway in the resistive tree and the total resistance uh, RT is broken down into two parts RT by 2 RT by 2 this is called the T model. Other model is the pi model in which the RT is in between two capacitances and uh, CT is the one that is broken down into CT by 2 and CT by 2 uh, and RT is the total uh, there is some typo here uh, total uh, CT is broken down into CT by 2 and RT remains same. And then there is a much more accurate n section representation. It is more accurate so to when you keep increasing the value of n it, will, it, it keeps on becoming more and more accurate. But obviously there has to be some limit uh, because the more sections you have again the more uh, compute intensive it becomes. So again it has two models T model and pi model. So T mod so in, e in both the models uh, CT is divided into CT by n and uh, RT is divided into RT by n. The only difference is that in T model the first and the last value is RT by 2n and in pi model the first and the last value is CT by 2n. So this is this is just these are just modeling techniques. So in, in effect in physical effect there is one single copper wire. Now uh, there are multiple techniques to model is and these models uh, again uh, the more sections you divide it into the more accurate it becomes and the more con compute intensive it becomes. This is uh, uh, this session is more about uh, the available techniques to do this thing, uh, but ultimately when we use prime time when we go to static timing analysis tool, we are not worried about what model is used. The mod the model used is dependent on what what detailed uh, parasitics have been fed into prime time, but otherwise we should not be concerned about what is the model used whether it's a n section model whether it's a t model or a pi model. Once we are given the uh, parasitic data, we just read it into prime time and then uh, using report timing we can report the value of capacitance and resistance, but that value is the, is the combined load. For example, the report timing report will show the combined value of capacitance at any pin, right. It will not show the section information because again it is an, uh, it is just uh, the way prime time uh, will reduce things, it will calculate delay, we do not have to be, we can just read about it. but when we do static timing analysis we should not be too concerned about it. Now let us see if, uh, now uh, in the case in case of field out SPA when uh, the parasitic information is not there we use something called wire model which are used to estimate cap R the area overhead and the length of the net based on the number of its final. Uh, let us take one example how do we do that we have already seen that there are different wire models in standard cell library. Um, for example, here it is given there are three models given light, conservative, and aggressive. Uh, it also tells us uh, for what area it is suitable and so on. Now, this is one example where uh, a wire load model uh, tells us uh, gives us some numbers. One is the resistance number, I think it should be per unit length, capacitance number per unit length, area per unit length. This is the slope of the curve. And now it tells us that for what fan out what is the length let us say for fan out 1 length is 2.6 for fan out 2 length is 2.9 for fan out 3 length is 3.2 and so on. Using this data what the tool will do for each of each of the net it will try to calculate the R and C and the length and the area value based on these numbers. Let us see how does it do that let me clear the annotation first here. Now, now let us see uh, let us uh, take a look at an uh, net which has a fan out of 8. Now from the previous data we see that for fan out length of 5 excuse me for fan out of 5 the length is 4.1. This is the maximum that wire load model specifies. So for a fan out of 8 the tool will try to extrapolate. So uh, for for the value of uh, for value of 5 it is 4.1. So it uses simple uh, a straight line uh, formula to calculate the value at fan out of 8. So what it does is it, it 4.1 plus 8 minus 5 which is the this, this offset into the slope this is why slope is used to help us help the tool in doing the interpolation and extrapolation right. 
So length is 5.6. Now, based on this length, it can calculate the capacitance because it knows the length and the capacitance coefficient, which is which is 1.1. The resistance coefficient is 5.0. Again, we have got the value of resistance. Again, area overhead is length into area per second, and then so on. So this is how, based on the wire load model data, the tool is able to calculate for every net just by knowing the fan out. It will calculate the length, capacitance, resistance, and area overall. Again, these are just estimates. The things change a lot when we go to post layout. Now, when when it when we talk about wire load models or estimations, uh, and the tool will consider uh, there are there are three so. First, it will choose a wire load model based on area, for example, and then it will it needs to know what tree type is targeted. So there are three tree types. You can use. Uh, we'll see in the lab that we've already noticed this uh, uh, this term. This term has come across in when we saw the uh, standard cell library. It it mentions uh, the tree type either best case tree or worst case tree and so on. So let's see what this tree type is. So in the best case tree, it is assumed that destination uh, pin, the load pin, is right next to the driver. What it means is that there is no resistance from the driver to the destination pin, and but the only thing being considered here is the cap, the pin capacitance, right? So what that is why it is called a best case tree because it assumes the resistance to be zero. So this R is not accounted for. All these uh, these receivers and the drivers, it's assumed that they are sitting next to each other, and there is virtually no resistance. The only thing taken is the pin capacitance of each of the uh, each of the uh, receiver pin. It is obviously an optimistic case. Second is the balance tree. Now, in balance tree, the R and C is equally divided among all the Receivers, all the fan outs. So uh, the total uh, resistance being R wire, total capacitance being C wire. This this section has R by C, R by N and C by N. This section has R by N and C by N. Again, the same section has R by N and C by N. This is a balanced tree. Worst case tree, what it assumes that the destination pin, uh, each of the destination pin sees the complete resistance. It is uh, this. This will only happen when these uh, the fan outs are the fan, the receiver cells are sitting right at the end of the wire far end of the wire so the first case assume the best case assume that this receiver pin is right sitting right next to this one the balance assume that each of the fan out is each of the receiver cell is at equidistant from the uh, uh, it is at uh, uh, yeah equidistant point from the driver the worst case tree assumes that all the receivers are sitting at the far end of the driver, and each of them will see the complete R and C. So obviously, this is a this is a worst case scenario. So the the typical scenario will lie somewhere between worst and best, which is the balance tree. So again, this is a wire load model character characteristic and not the real parasitic characteristic. This is what what kind of layout is assumed, right? So uh, usually you don't need to worry about it. And uh, it is some of it is uh, set in library by default. So when you do a report wire load model, you can see that what what kind of tree is taken, or you can open up the standard cell library and see that. So this is the command to specify a wire load model. We've already seen that in design compiler. The command is exactly same for prime time. Um, in that sense, in, actually in pre layout, when we talk about the pre layout stage, the design compiler and prime time they behave. Exactly same in the sense that most of the commands are similar, and the only thing different is that prime time is a much more advanced SPA tool. And when we want to work with real paras parasitics, we cannot work in design compiler. So the, there's a uh, the timing engine inside design compiler is faster compared to prime time. It has less features and it is more suited to synthesis. Whereas the prime time sign off engine is built for sign off at various technologies it has much more it is much more accurate it is the data the calculation is matched with respect to spice and it has lot more features 
to aid us in doing static timing analysis. But at a pre layout stage, uh, there are very few differences. So we have also seen via load modes, uh, top enclosed and segmented, I'll quickly uh, revise them. Uh, the top via load model, uh, the via load model of the top level is used for all the lower level blocks. Uh, in case of enclosed, uh, the via load model that uh, is used uh, for the design which encloses the complete net. So, for example, in this case, WLM light encloses this complete net. So, the via load model WLM light would be used. The segmented via load model. Uh, uh, divides the hierarchical net into segments and a unique via load model is used for each segment that depends on the uh, design and the under which this net is imposed. For example, uh, this this part of the net, uh, this part of the net is enclosed inside B3 and WL underscore AGGR is used for B3, so WL underscore AGGR will be used for this segment. For the second segment, WL light will be used. For the third segment, WL underscore TYP will be used. So we have already seen this, that's why I went to move over it. This is how Violet model is represented in the cell library. We have already seen this in unit 3, I'll move forward. Now let's come to the actual parasitic data when we are working at the post layout stage. So uh, where do parasitics come from? So uh, first uh, we give the synthesized netlist to the, the physical design. Uh, Team or the guy or the, or the person who's doing physical design. It can be you or it can be some other person. Now, uh, now the design uh, along with constraints is taken through the back end, the physical design flow. The first part of the flow is placement, uh, then it will, there will be clock tree synthesis, and then it will go through detailed routing. After routing, when the physical data is completely generated, uh, GDS is generated. There are tools, extraction tools, which from the layout, now the layout has all the information about all the nodes and cell placement, right? So there these tools, uh, one of the tools is called star RTXC from Synopsis. So uh, this tool will take, read in the layout data, it will read in the technology specific files which has the information that what is the uh, thickness and what is the, what are the coefficients for different metal layers using those that data it will generate the parasitic file. Now these parasitic files can be in one of the three formats. Either they could be in the format DSPF detailed standard parasitic format or RSPF reduced standard parasitic format or SPEF which is standard parasitic expression format. In one of these so the tool will extract the data and it will put data into a file which will conform to one of these three formats. Now, the most detailed format is DSPF. The format is same as SPICE. What it means is that each node is extracted. The R and C value will be present for each and, each and every node. And obviously, since it's represented in SPICE format, you can use any SPICE tool to read in and analyze. But again, at a full chip level, it will become very, very time consuming. And plus, this file is huge. For even a simple design, this file might run into DB or, or hundreds of MB. Right? Syntax is obviously too detailed because there is a lot of information here. And it is used for only very special cases where you want to see when you want to do some spice analysis. Spice analysis will be more accurate than prime time or any other static timing analysis tool. Again, it takes so much more time, right? On the other end of the spectrum is a reduced standard parasitic format, RSPF. In case of RSPF, uh, the parasitics are represented in reduced form. So what is reduced? Not every node is represented. Uh, for example, take a look at this design where a, where a, where a CK buff is, or a buffer is driving two flops. Now, in this case, it will be split into two parts, one and two. Now, the first part, which is the, this is called the driver model. A driver will be represented by, let's say, a, a pi interface. Uh, and then the receivers will be represented by, again, RNC value. And now, 
uh, at the receiver end the driver will be reduced to a, a voltage source voltage and current a voltage source or a or a current control current source this rspf can also be used to as an input to spice simulator there are some limitations here uh, i think one of the limitations one has written here that bi directional signal flow cannot be represented and i am not sure if coupling capacity if and it if it has coupling capacitance and i don't don't think it has so it doesn't have coupling capacitance so you cannot do signal integrity or noise analysis using this rspf and there is one format called spef which is which is the most popular industry format for static time analysis why because it is balanced in the sense that it is not as detailed as dspf but it has uh, enough information what it means that it has detailed parasitics up to some extent it also has coupling capacitance but uh, it is of a similar format as a dspf uh, similar to the spice uh, it does not have every node so it does so the uh, the approximation is done at the level of the extraction tool the extraction tool will make some approximations or it will make some do some modeling and it will dump a uh, step which will be slightly less detailed than dspf but it will have the coupling capacitance also so with with spec we can do noise and signal integrity as well so this is the most popular industry standard format and uh, i also use this a lot in my uh, in the on the chips i'm working on so uh, again we would be talked about that uh, every time uh, our wish will be to reduce the interconnect resistance and capacitance both Uh, some ways are listed here one of the way is to make the nets wider a wider net will have lower uh, coefficient of resistance i mean uh, the uh, obviously the resistance of a net is inversely proportional to its area area of cross section of the bit so the more wider a wire is the more current it can carry easily and resistance goes down routing in upper thicker metals uh, in a fabrication process the metal layers at the top of the stack are more are wider and thicker so usually have lower resistance and uh, most of the time they are used to route power signals and clocks which are most critical in the design so power signals are very critical why because uh, an increased resistance of on power signal will cause more ir drop issues so the more r the more ir drop that is why power signals will use the uh, topmost routing layers uh, to reduce the resistance to as much extent as possible the top level layers are also used for clock routing because clock is a signal that goes to goes globally it fans out to so many registers and uh, the lower uh, uh, i mean clock uh, you don't don't want to have signal integrity issues on clock it will cause a lot of problems that is why you use uh, upper metal layers so these these are two ways either we use uh, wider uh, metal uh, metals or we use the upper metal layer they are by default so now uh, let's see how do we read parasitics in prime time uh, so read parasitic command reads the parasitic data file either in spec for rspf or there is one more format called synopsis binary parasitic format it just converts the ascii format you can just read this uh, any ascii format uh, parasitic file into prime time and uh, into some and in design and prime time i think and you can write out the binary parasitic format uh, so this uh, the process of reading parasitics and mapping it onto design is called back annotation and uh, the read parasitics command uh, by default it can recognize the file format from the file itself so so giving the specifying the format is optional obviously the net and instance pin name in the design must match the corresponding net and instance pin name in the parasitic file a parasitic file should have one to one correspondence with the design if not then what may happen is that some of the uh, nets will not get parasitic data so when reading the parasitic file by default pt assumes that the capacitance inside spec does not include the pin capacitance the pin capacitance value always comes from the standard cell attribute so again uh, 
delay has two parts cell delay and net delay a cell what properties does it have a cell has the delay is represented in the lookup table but it also has capacitance on the node each input and each output of uh, an output of a cell both has some inherent pin capacitance and that capacitance value goes in the standard cell library not in the spec a spec will only contain interconnect data not cell data although it would connect so it will tell us what the nodes are so for example in this case uh, let's see this design what inter what the spec will contain it can it will contain this node instance name slash z pin to sdff1 slash cp pin and this is one net so it will contain the rnc value of this net but the capacitance inherent capacitance value of the bus at z and of the flip flop at cp will come from the standard cell level still right so so just we are, the thing to remember here is that parasitic spec SPEF or DSPF or RSPF, they just contain the interconnect data. That's it. So uh, the reduced and detailed parasitic uh, RC networks specified in PEF file are used to con compute effective capacitance. We'll talk about what effective capacitance is. So uh, this is a part of delay calculation. So the capacitance value. This is mo most important thing. this you should uh, sorry yeah this is the thing that you should remember the capacitance value reported by most report command such as report timing or report net is the lumped capacitance what it means is that now a net an interconnect will have multiple segments but during the process of delay calculation what time time will do it will calculate a single value which is the effective capacitance this is to speed up the delay calculation and it will show this value this lumped value when you do a report timing or do a report net amount it will not show us that how did it calculate the effective capacitance it will not show us how many segments were there it will not show us what algorithm it used to calculate the value of the circuit so we have to make we have to note that the value of capacitance we see in any of the commands we do is the lumped capacitance or c total c total is the sum of all capacitance value of a net so usually in most of the cases it is the sum uh, in case of nldm i think it is the sum but uh, i have never verified whether uh for a particular net that all the capacitance inside the spec plus all the pin capacitance are they is c total the simple sum of all or not i'm not sure but uh again the thing to remember here is that any report you do will report a single value of cap at a particular node and that will contain the effect of the pin cap plus the net cap now let's come to delay calculation so to perform sta prime time must accurately calculate so what prime time calculates is first it calculates the delay through each cell whether it be combination or sequential it needs to calculate the delay for and gate from pin a to pin output from pin b to the output or sequential cell it will be from clock to queue and second thing at each node it needs to calculate the transition why because uh, again the delay depends on the transition value for example the delay at the output of an and gate a two input and and gate will depend on the load at the output plus the transition at input again let's so there will be let's say there is one buffer there is one buffer let's say driving another buffer so to calculate the delay here to calculate the delay is this at this point prime time needs to know the transition at this point plus the load at this point again to know the transition here prime time this transition here will be some function of the transition at this point again delay is calculated at this point at this point and transition is calculated at this point so at every node 
prime time needs to calculate delay and transition both at every stage. A stage, any stage, it come from prices of a driving cell, the RC network in between, and plus the receiver cell, the network, the load pins, right? So what is the goal? The goal is to compute the response at driver output and at the network load pins given what is what is given value given the input slew so input transition is a is a requirement for prime time to calculate the output delay plus the output transition let's see a figure which will explain it all so let's see uh, for example uh, on the left hand side you have a netlist it is a simple circuit without any RC value. When it goes to physical design, it will get the RC values, and, and the network will look, look something like this, something like this, the one on the lower end, with the different R values and different C values. Right. So the on the upper, uh, on the uh, on the top, uh, the figure does not have any R values, only the C values. So this this tells us this C. So these values. Are the ones that are coming from the library? These values. These are the pin cap values which are coming from the library itself. Here, this R value, this R value, and this C value, this C value, they come from the spec, from the parasitic data. So, uh, when we have uh, the nonlinear delay form uh, delay model. Which comes from the standard cell library. So, standard cell library will define some lookup tables for uh, delay and transition both. This type of model is called nonlinear delay model. The nonlinear delay model is slightly going out of use. Uh, present day uh, in uh, lower technologies, uh, 65 nanometer and beyond, uh, CCS uh, constant current source model is most popular. But uh, that is uh, outside the scope of this course, so we will only talk about nonlinear delay model. It does not, as a as a synthesis and FPA uh, engineer, you don't need to be concerned a lot about which model is used, either NLDM or CCS or something else. Uh, we are we are more uh, this is these are two related things, and uh, these they go in conjunction with what is the library. Who is the library vendor? What is the parasitic data, and so on? So uh, we should just know about it. What is is being used? You can go ahead and read about the CCS. But the more important task as at hand is how to define the constraints, how to make sure that a design is fully and properly constrained. That is the goal of SD, right? And uh, uh, next step, we should know how to solve the timing variations. That is the next step before signing off. So we'll talk a bit about NLDM. So in case of NLDM, uh, any circuit, let's say a circuit like this, prime time will divide it into three parts. One is the driver model. So let's say we I have again a buffer driving a buffer. So this buffer is a driver. It will be represented by a driver model. This interconnect here in between. Will be represented by a reduced order network model, and the buffer, the the receiver buffer here, the load buffer here, will be represented as receiver model. These three things here, they tell us that the fan out is free. For example, now the driver model is intended to reproduce the response of the driving cell circuitry when connected to arbitrary RC network. What it means is that the driver model of a buffer, for example. Should be independent of the interconnection price. Where does the driver model come from? The driver model comes from the standard cell level, right? So here at the driver uh, at the driver level, prime time will assume will will calculate the waveform. And where does this waveform come from? It comes from uh, some load here. So this load here is the pin capacitance. And the input transition. Now, this input transition would be a result of a previous stage calculation, or it is a primary port, and you have set input transition here, whatever. But this is a driver model. 
or NNDM, this driver model should tell us what is the waveform rule, what is the nature of the waveform rule, that is it. Now the, the receiver model is intended to represent the complex input capacitance, why complex? Uh, because the capacitance there is not a fixed value and it just depends on how the, uh, this is what is, is uh, more accurate in CCS when compared to an NLDM, this calculation. So it represents the complex, complex input capacitance of the cell input pin, of this input pin, of this buffer here, including the effects of rise fall direction, the transition of this pin, slew or transfer, same thing, the receiver output load, the state of the cell, and then so many things, right? So the the receiver, the receiver buffer here is reduced to a single C effective value. So this value here C is nothing but the C effective value. The reduced order model, the network model X1, is a simplified representation of the full parasitic network here. So this is where this is where prime time will employ some optimize some uh, algorithms to calculate the the delay through this RC network. So any network, any parasitic network, whatever comes from spare, will get reduced to a very simple uh, simple circuit which prime time will use to calculate the delay. So uh, please please spend some time in reading this and understanding this. How does the prime time reduce a network and represent it into a driver model, a reduced order network model and a receiver model. Now let us talk about the effective capacitance. So what is effective capacitance? I summarize again, effective capacitance is a, a single capacitance value in case of NLDM, we know that the effective, effective capacitance is very, very specific to NLDM is a single value of capacitance which is used to represent the load, the fan out load of a single cell, right. So effective capacitance approach is employed to handle the effect of both R and C. It is a single capacitance that can be utilized as an equivalent load. So in this case, the RC interconnect, so uh, what prime time will do, it will reduce this RC interconnect into something like this, where C effective, where this is the driver model and this is the C effective. E effective is nothing but a single cap value which will replace the load, right. Now effective capacitance as we discussed before is a function of so many things. So uh, this is let's say one, one, uh, one particular graph where the total capacitance is mapped, the actual load is mapped and then effective capacitance is calculated. Now we see that uh, there is obviously some difference, so this effective capacitance would be different from the total cap, so, so total capacitance, uh, uh, so total capacitance I guess uh, would be the, uh, would be the most inaccurate because uh, it will not take into effect, it will just be the sum of all the capacitance, it will not take into effect the rise and fall transitions and so on. The actual load, I guess would be, uh, should be most accurate because it will be segmented load, whereas effective capacitance is uh, something that STA tool calculates to make the job faster, calculate the delay faster, otherwise it will be after as five. So that the, the idea, uh, the aim of behind STA tool calculating C effective is first to make the delay calculation faster and second, it should not be too inaccurate, it should be within some percentage of the five calculation. Right. Usually they will target about 2 to 3 percent. Third is the Elmo delay, uh, Elmo delays are applicable for RC3, so this is what, Elmo delay is a very, very basic formula used to calculate the delay of an RC3. Uh, in case of when you read Steph, prime time will not use Elmo delay, it will use some, some other calculation, which I am not sure about what it is, uh, you do not need to worry about that. Only when you read, when you uh, read in a reduced parasitic format, an RSPS, only then prime time will use Elmo delay, because Elmo delay is a, is a very crude approximation, and RSPF on the, uh, RSPF does not contain a lot of parasitic data, it already has a reduced format, so Elmo delay is applied only when RSPF is there. It has a single input node, does not have any resistive loops, 
and all capacitances are between a node and a ground. For such networks, prime time will employ L mode delay. Let's see what L mode delay equation is. So any network which has R and C, uh, so any network which can be segmented into such case, the L mode delay is. Uh, so uh, the delay through the first section is C1 R1. The delay through second section is so. So if we talk about the delay through at one, it will be C1 into R1. At two, it will be C1 into R1. C1 into R1 plus C2 into R1 plus R2. So at any node, it will be so. That this is the generic formula T D N is equal to summation of C I and then. Each of the capacitance multiplied by the sum of all the resistances seen by it. For example, at at C I, the delay would be C1 R1 plus C2 R1 plus R2 plus C I minus 1 R I minus 1 plus R1 plus R1 and so on. At node I, it will be C I into so assuming the all the R values are same, R1 let's let's assume everything to be R. So it will be Ci into n times r plus Ci minus one into n minus one times r and so on. So this is the equation for L mode delay. Again, this is a very very basic formula. Might not be very accurate, but it's used by prime time when you root read RSPF. Now uh, there is a very interesting case of slew merging. Now now at any node at any node like like. Let's say a NAND gate here at Z. Prime time can have only one transition value. Prime time cannot maintain multiple transition values at every node. Otherwise, this will blow up the delay calculation. So, prime time maintains only one value. This value will have two limits, max and a min. So, in fact, two values, but the max and a min. So, now uh, the the transition at Z. Will depend since it has two input pins. The transition at Z will depend on both the transition at input A and transition at input B. So, for example, uh, so now depending on the type of timing analysis, whether it's a max or a min, which of the slews will get propagated? That is the problem. So, uh, it will have two delays. It will have delay from A to Z, delay from B to Z. These delay values are separate, but the transition at Z can be calculated using the transition of either A or transition of either B. Now, there is a variable in uh, in time time called timing through propagation mode. It can be set to one of the two values. Now, let's say we are talking about the max path analysis. We discussed already what is max path analysis. Max path analysis is used for setup path, setup or constraint checking. It is usually done in the world. It is more typical in worst case library when we consider worst case scenario, a worst case operating condition. So there can be two. Uh, the variable can be controlled to select which transition number would be used to calculate the transition at Z. One is the worst slew, other is the worst arrival. What it means is that now let's say this is okay. This is A. This is B. Now let's say A has. Or B has a better slew that when compared to A. So when we set this variable to worst slew propagation mode, prime time will calculate the value of transition at Z using the transition at A because A has a worst transition. This is the most pessimistic mode, and you should be using this almost always. Why? Because in this case, we are not worried about whether. So the, now the second mode. When we, I'll talk about second mode, and then we'll know why this is pessimistic. The second mode is worst arrival. What it tells us that, what it tells prime time is that, whatever arrives later, use that transition. This is a slightly more accurate analysis. Why? Because now let's say B arrives later. So typically the critical path would be through B. Why? Because B is arriving later. Since the delay at B is more, so the critical path, the setup critical path, would be to B, and ideally it should use the transition at B. But when you use when you use this uh, the the variable and set it to worst slew propagation, 
even if sorry even if b is arriving later it will use the transition at a so it will always always get a worse value in this case uh, so in most of the cases we use this this will make the analysis a bit more pessimistic but we are okay with it for min path for whole timing calculation it will use the best slew or best arrival so when we set the variable to slew propagation it will use worst slew for max path it will use best slew for the for the whole for setup it will use worst slew for whole it will use the best slew which is the most more pessimistic analysis and it is more suitable it's good to have so every i think the default value is slew propagation so the value can be the slew propagation or arrival propagation when you use slew propagation for setup it will take the worst slew for whole it will take the best slew so this is a uh, please don't worry if you don't get uh, what i'm talking about this is a slightly advanced technique uh, this is a slightly advanced uh, topic and uh, once we go to lab i'll show you what how does it affect so when it when you see this thing happening in the lab you'll understand it better the second problem about transitions is we are uh, so this, these are all problems that come in delay calculation that's why we are discussing this uh, these are all issues with delay calculation so other problem comes when there are different slew thresholds we have already seen what slew thresholds are slew thresholds are uh, the limit values between uh, which the prime time should calculate the transition the transition values they can be 20 80 10 90 30 70 and so on if you have cells so if you are sourcing standard cells from only one single library all will have the same threshold so there's no issue but let's say u1 is from one library u2 u2 is from other library u3 is from some other library and they these might have different slew threshold values in this case uh, we don't have to worry a lot time time does a good job it will see what is the threshold value at each cell and it will calculate the, it properly for example let's see let's take this example u1 is characterized with 2080 u2 has a 1090 U3 has a 3070 and a slew rate of 0.5. The rate simply means that multiply that factor by the slew value. The rate means that whatever slew value is calculated will be multiplied by 0.5. Now let's say the slew at Z is something. This is the slew at Z. So uh, slew at U3 A uh, and slew to A, slew at U2 A are calculated. How they are calculated? First, the waveform is plotted. and after plotting the waveform what we prime time will do it for example for u2 for u2 it will now take the 1090 number for u3 it will take the 3070 numbers but it will multiply that value by 0.5 because the rate is 0.5 the delay calculation is simple delay calculation is simply 50% here and 50% here this is the difference this is the delay but the transition numbers get calculated based on what are the slew threshold so it is okay to have different slew threshold although it's not recommended uh delay calculation will become much more simpler and much more accurate if we use libraries so a particular library vendor will make sure that all his cells have same threshold number this is to make delay calculation simpler and more accurate right okay let's move ahead so this is a formula which tells what is the slew uh, what is the relationship between 1090 slew and 2080 slew so you can also do this also as a simple formula slew, slew 2080 divided by 0.8 minus 0.2 is equal to slew 1090 divided by 0.9 minus 0.1 So if you know the slew at uh, 1090, you can calculate the slew at 2080. Obviously, the 2080 numbers will be less than the 1090 numbers because again, the region between 2080 is less than the region between 1080. So how the combination part delay is calculated? Uh, we we did one example uh, when we were calculating the clock latency in the last lecture. So, for example, the uh, prime time wants to calculate the fault delay. So, every node will have fault delay and write delay, because not every not the cells, the standard cells and net are not symmetrical in terms of rise and fall. So, each node, in fact, each node will have four values. 
in fact it will have a rise value and a fall value and for each rise and fall value it will have a max value and a min value we'll see the how max and min comes into play here just please note that every node will have rise delay fall delay for rise delay it will have a max value and a min value for fall delay it will have a max value and a min value so so for example the fall value at at this point at this node the final node will be fall here would mean rise at a, fall at n3 would mean rise at n2 fall at n1 rise at n0 so it will be tn0 rise ta fall because that is falling tn1 fall tb rise because now uh, that will rise tn2 rise plus tc fall again this is a very simple equation not much to worry about you can read about it so uh, every node uh, so to calculate the rise delay at any node prime time will go back to the first input port or to the first sequential cell rate it encounters it so again remember it will break uh, all the complete design into different timing paths and then for each timing path it will calculate the delay this is how it calculates the delay part to flip flop again uh, it is very similar to how the Uh, delay is calculated for combination. There is no difference here. The mechanism, the algorithm, they are all same. Uh, the only thing for uh, a flip flop, uh, the only extra thing is the calculation of t setup and t hold constraint, t recovery, t removal, and so on. There are constraints in sequential cell. There are no constraints in a combinational cell. So again, it is same. So the, the, this slide, what it the, the two slides, what they are uh, they are stressing the fact that prime time. will care about unitness that means what what is unitness so an inverter is a negative unit that means a rise at n0 will cause a fall at n1 a rise here will cause a fall here will cause a fall here a buffer is a positive unit a rise at the input of a buffer will cause a rise at the output of the buffer so prime time will will worry about the unitness it will calculate the delay according to this it needs to know the unitness that is why you see that if you go back to the standard cell library you see any timing table you will see that it also mentions the unit cell so for example a nor gate is a negative unit and gate is positive unit and so on right so you just have to see what is the relationship between input and output in terms of when input rises the output rises or falls and that defines the unitness of the path now uh, there are multiple paths uh, in a complex design uh, let's say let's consider a flop to flop path like this a flop to flop path like this might have multiple timing paths the path that takes the longest is called the worst late or a max path because that is critical for setup so for example here this dotted path is the is a worst path it is the longest path longest path is used for setup calculation for setup check the min path the shortest path is used for hold timing check now in the last session the last slide had one exercise where you had to calculate you have to calculate the setup and the hold slack and in that i have mentioned two values the max value and the min value so this is why every node this is one reason why every node will have a max value and a min value because there are multiple paths through number of cells right and any complex design will have any design you do you do any design you will find out that between two registers or input to register or register to output there might be multiple paths so not two paths they they can be 10 paths they can be 20 paths but it prime time will calculate part delay to through every node and it will note down the so it at at deep end it will note down what is the worst arrival for rise it will note down what is the worst arrival for fall it will note down what is the worst best arrival for rise what is the best arrival for fall this will become very very clear in the lab just please note this is just to the fact that there are multiple paths and what prime time worries about is the longest path and the shortest path Although you can actually trace through any path, but uh, the longest and the shortest will mean most for the setup critical path and the hold critical path. 
we have no we saw what is slack calculation uh, this slide just uh, again uh, repeats that slack is a difference between required time and the time when a signal arrives there is one example where so this is the one example where it uh, this slide will cal will calculate the uh, the slack here the period is 10 nanosecond here the data arrives uh, the data arrives at uh, 1 the setup so data the setup time here is 3 data required is 7 so 7 minus 1 the slack is 6 this is how slack is calculated we will see a lot more this in the lab right so that's all for this session so again the focus of this session is was to uh, make uh, you all familiar with the concept of interconnect uh, the fact that interconnect uh, there are different format for interconnect like dstf rstf and stf stuff is the most popular uh, interconnect format the data contained in interconnect format is the only the rnc values of the internet it doesn't have any cell capacitance value that is important to know and then uh, we know that when in case of nldm prime time will uh, will model the network as a driver model plus the reduced interconnect network model and plus the receiver model the receiver will be modeled as a simple single capacitance or well not not simple but a single effective capacitance called c effective or c total which will be showed when you do a report time minus capacitance and then we saw that uh, for uh, for transition calculation uh, uh, we will be okay so first we saw that uh, at every node prime time needs to calculate the delay plus the transition value we saw that what are the problems that can happen during transition calculation one is the skew merging this is one one good thing to know uh, second thing is uh, there can be different skew threshold uh, and then we saw that there are multiple paths and for each path prime time will calculate the uh, the worst path the longest path and the best path which is the shortest path the worst path is used for setup uh, check the best path is used for hold check right uh, this was all about interconnect and delay calculation. In next session, we'll see, uh, uh, we'll learn a lot more about clocks and exceptions. Thank you.